Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. My sincere thanks to listeners and those who have liked, subscribed, and commented. Your interest is noticed and deeply appreciated. A listener recently contacted me about something I mentioned in a previous podcast, which was my overhaul and restructuring of my rank test criteria. It seems to me that he was probably not the only person interested in the subject, so I'm going to go into more depth on it in today's podcast. When I resigned the Aikido organization I was in back in 2014, I started to look with careful scrutiny at everything that I had been taught and the methods that I was using. Something which had came to bother me more and more as time went on were the test criteria. I thought about changing them, but I didn't want to do so until I got something far better to replace them with. The reason the test criteria bothered me more and more over time was I realized how frequently we kept coming back to reviewing what was on the test list. In particular, the techniques that were on the first test, the Roku or the Yellow Belt. These techniques were the foundation that new students built their Aikido on. In coming back to them every time new students would start learning and preparing for their rank tests, I realized they were really the guiding light of the Aikido in our dojo. Exactly where your guiding light is leading you is very important. As background, the way the testing criteria went for Q ranks, which were below black belt ranks, up and through Shodan and Yudansha testing was that the first test, or Roku, consisted of prescribed attacks and response techniques. The test itself had 11 of them, and students would be expected to perform them as they were taught. The test also included demonstrations of forward rolls, backward rolls, and Shiko, which is knee walking. Students would also be required to demonstrate one of the Aikyu Taiso exercises as if showing them to a new student, as well as ending the test with Kokyudosa. I was told that the 11 techniques on the test that our organization inherited were chosen by Kuichi Tohei himself and were selected for particular fundamental concepts which were important to Aikido development. It took me a while to start spotting exactly what these fundamentals were, and in some cases I had to guess exactly what each one was. These considerations did not survive down through time, only the techniques on the test remained. I believe I identified, giving them greater scrutiny through the years, the valuable concepts that Tohei was intending for each one. As I considered them, I balanced out what I believe he was intending to get across with the fact that some of these techniques were very difficult for new students to get the hang of. We all know martial arts training is no picnic, and not everything comes easy. However, some of these techniques were so difficult and required advanced control that they were almost always performed poorly on the test itself. The fix was often to do something which I really dislike, which was to teach Uke to comply. The protocol in our dojo, which I believe is pretty common among all dojos, is to have the test Uke be more experienced. Usually, intermediate to advanced students play the role as Uke, so they can also work with the testing student leading up to the test, so this makes sense. What I noticed and experienced myself is that you want the new student to perform well and build their confidence. In order to do that, Ukes would go a little easy on some techniques so the new student could perform the technique reliably. Doing this creates a long-lasting bad habit in that Ukes get into the habit of being compliant. We never revisited whether these techniques themselves were the best fit for new students. I came to realize that most of the techniques were a poor fit for new students. Some were only mildly poor and others had no business being on the test. The principles these techniques taught are solid but after a lot of consideration, I found a better set of techniques which convey these fundamentals, which were easier for new students to learn and practice. These techniques don't require ukes to be compliant in order for nage to succeed with them. Admittedly, a few techniques that were on the original test were good fits for new students, so those I kept. There were two other major things I noticed about the test criteria. One, the attacks were limited to the typical stylized attacks that Aikido tends to suffer from, and two, the techniques were not self-defense oriented at all. Let me address each of these in detail. First, the stylized attacks. These were the same as virtually all Aikido uses, Shomenuchi, Yokomenuchi, Gemnetsuki, Munetsuki, shoulder grabs, lapel grabs, and wrist grabs of several varieties, same side, cross hand, both wrists, and two hands on one wrist. There were a few exceptions, even on the first test, with Ushuro Dori, which is a bear hug from behind, or choke from behind, but these were not very common. I was taught what I'm sure most Aikidoka hear from their instructors, that the stylized striking attacks of Shomenuchi, Yokomenuchi, and Ski represent the basic trajectories of all attacks, 
and therefore provide adequate practice at dealing with virtually any attack, including kicks. This is partially true, but this limited repertoire of attacks is entirely inadequate for self-defense or full martial arts training. They are really only good for practicing choreography. My first and biggest problem is with Shomenuchi. We are constantly told that this attack comes from a straight down sword attack to the head, which is a common attack with sword combat. Straight down attacks are not as common as people who have not fought with swords believe they are. They do happen, but since they are the easiest sword strikes to see coming and deal with, they almost always need to be set up first. Yet, Aikido uses them as a lead attack. The second reassurance instructors offer is that Shomenuchi represents someone hitting you with a hammer fist strike or swinging a beer bottle at your head. This statement is an attempt to justify an attack which really doesn't make much sense and to sound credible to the reality of real-world violence. Unfortunately, this straight-down attack to the head is very uncommon. Not to say that it never happens, but it is far more likely to experience swinging attacks such as roundhouses or haymakers, even with weapons or bottles. The main benefit of the Shomenuchi attack is that it provides a very clear and easy to identify telegraph of the attack which is about to happen. This makes it easy for Nage to spot and choose his technique to apply. My background is in a full contact sparring art, and one of the most important things you need to do if you want to succeed in your attack is not to telegraph it. The last thing you want is for your opponent knowing what exact attack you are throwing, and if you're skilled enough, he should not even see an attack coming at all. If he does see it, he should have a difficult time identifying what is about to happen. Shomenuchi and Yokomenuchi both violate these basic tenets of combat. In a street ambush or attack, you should not count on telegraphing movement to indicate what attack is coming. Punches thrown out of anger can include a big windup, for example with the haymaker. But there are many street attack videos showing fast and short knockouts without the big haymaker windup. A martial art which relies on attacks having big telegraphing movements to provide warning of what is about to come is not much of a martial art at all. Now in their defense, Shomenuchi and Yokomenuchi are good for starting raw beginners who need the assistance of being able to see what is coming. However, you don't need overly stylized attacks which are not representative of what they will likely see in a self-defense situation in order to do that. I believe it is best to have Uke move as close to the real thing as possible so Nage gets used to reading accurate body shifts and movements. The farther you get away from that real movement, the more likely Nage is to misread Uke and not recognize the attack. This leads to a high likelihood of failure. The last thing in the world I want to do is set up my students for failure. Therefore, I have virtually eliminated Shomenuchi and Yokomenuchi from training and I removed them from the tests. The reasoning is that I don't want to keep coming back to the first test preparations and reintroducing attacks which aren't going to be on further testing requirements. The attacks that I've chosen are far better and more realistic than the stylized versions Aikido usually does. This means my students don't need to readjust their Aikido against more realistic attacks later. Their ability to accurately read real attacks starts from day one. I've tested this with new people and found no reason to go back to the overly stylized attacks. For a while, I taught them with the stated intention that if my students visited other dojos, I do still teach them from time to time, with the stated intention that if my students visit other dojos, they should be able to attack correctly and perform technique properly from them. I'm now at the point where almost no adjustment is needed to deal with these stylized attacks. If you learn to deal effectively with more realistic attacks, Shomenuchi and Yokomenuchi are child's play to deal with. That brings me to Gamnetsky. A straight punch to the face is a common real attack, and one which needs a solid technique a new student can learn and be confident with in their first few months. The technique against Gamnetsky, which is on our old Roku test, was one of the most problematic and required Uke to slow way down and provide a huge telegraph to make it work. This really bothered me as I never saw a single new student be confident in this technique over more than 10 years of seeing them try. This signaled to me that it wasn't the student's fault, this was the failure of the system. I thought it might be the instructor's fault, but all of us tried very hard to get this technique to work, but always had to cheat on it. Even the most talented students only got mixed results with it. This meant that it needed to be abandoned. It's so problematic that I no longer teach it even to advanced students. I felt that the techniques on the first test in particular needed to be simple, direct, reliable, easy to learn, and low risk. By low risk, I mean that if they do fail, they do not leave Nage in a vulnerable position. 
This was the basic yardstick by which I evaluated every technique which was going to be in the first test. If it didn't measure up to these, it was removed from consideration. That wasn't the only criteria that I used when I overhauled the first test, though. One concept that I kept in mind was Bruce Lee's statement that a man with six months of boxing and six months of wrestling would likely beat about any martial artist with 10 years' experience. I'm paraphrasing that here. It's not the exact quote. As I looked around, I saw other arts such as Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu could build solid skills in their students in six months, skills which are very self-defense applicable. Yet with Aikido, students can study for years without building decent self-defense skills. New students are told that Aikido is so complex that it takes years of training before you can hope to have practical skills. Aikidoka often make this statement with smug pride as though it's something to boast about. Yet we see many practitioners who have no practical skills even after training a decade or more. You might think this is an inaccurate statement, and I felt my perception might be off, so I outright asked many Aikidoka this question. How long did you study Aikido before you felt confident dealing with a real attacker? I asked this of anyone with black belt rank, including 4th and 5th degree black belts. The lowest number I recall hearing was in the 6 to 8 year range. An alarming number of them replied that they never got this confidence. That's right, in 10 to 20 years of training, they still don't feel skilled enough to deal with real violence. This indicated to me how far Aikido drifted off the path. We're not talking about mastery of combat here. We are talking enough familiarity with the basics to be confident in handling a violent situation. These are things even a high school wrestler builds within his first year. My main goal was to put together a first test, Roku, criteria that would do far better with building the confidence other arts instill in their new students. This was mostly for their own benefit, but I felt that it was also for the benefit of the art, as well as my own dojo. I felt prospective students are turned off by being told it would be a decade or more of training before they have useful or practical skills. These skills can and will be built on over time to achieve a high level of competency, but there is no reason that the first six months aren't solidly productive with students feeling tangible progress towards good self-defense skills. To further elaborate, the techniques on the first test were always done from a static position. In particular, all grabs were static grabs, meaning that Uke would grab and stand still, then Nage would execute technique. On all subsequent tests, attacks were always from oncoming, meaning that Nage was expected to start moving before the grab formed completely. I believe that this progression was an attempt to simplify things for new students. What I found was that new students can easily grasp the concept of moving preemptively. I still teach from static grabs initially, but by the time the first test is administered, which is usually around the six to eight month mark, students are easily comfortable with applying technique from oncoming attacks. There's no reason to force them back to working from static grabs, so all grab attacks were from oncoming on the first test. My other main goal with looking at what I put on the first test was to start building more well-rounded martial artists. I thought back to Bruce Lee's statement once again. The organization I was in had some ground defense work but this didn't come into the testing until brown belt level or so. As I asked myself why, no good answer came to me. Instead, I asked myself if there was any reason not to teach new students how to survive the ground from day one. There was no reason not to. I worked closely with a friend who has a strong wrestling background and is also a law enforcement officer. He has used his grappling background many times and adapted it from sport to real world application. He trained me and helped me build a curriculum of ground survival which is designed for self-defense. As we built this, I picked the fundamentals from that curriculum and included the most important portions on the first test. Another aspect of the testing criteria I inherited from my old organization was randori. The initial test had no randori, but each subsequent test did. The Gokyu and Sankyu tests included a two-uke randori. The Nikyu and Ikyu tests included a three-person randori and the Shodan tests included a four-person randori. Because randori was fairly important to us, and we enjoyed training it, usually an extra uke would be added in. I recall starting with two uke on a purple belt test and having a third thrown in midway, and three uke with a fourth thrown in on my Nikyu test. Anyway, randori training is something I took on with a passion when my instructor started having me teach classes. This started for me after I was a brown belt. My full contact art included melees, which were facing multiple opponents, so I had a lot of experience with how to do it. 
I took lessons that I learned and integrated them with my Aikido. Then I made them into teachable lessons. This worked so well that I can take even beginning students with no martial art experience and instill the fundamentals of movement to deal with multiple attackers from day one of their training. In fact, I've found it works far better that way. Get them before they build a fear or apprehension of randori. The skills of randori are far different than applying a single technique over and over again. The next logical progression was to change the approach of the original testing criteria and add the randori element to it, even from the first test. Although I start training new students in multiple uke randori right away, I felt that it would be far better to merely have a single uke attack nage however he wanted to. This includes moving around and approaching, feinting or misdirecting to set up his attack, and relentlessly continuing his attack until he can't anymore. Nage isn't safe until uke is down. This gives even new students the feel of dealing with a live and determined attacker. It breaks the mold of paired kata where you know what attack is coming and you must remember the defense. I call this the one uke randori. It's pretty much an Aikido version of live rolling or sparring because they are having to deal with repeated and active attacking on a constant basis. Of course, I teach them the skills and methods to effectively deal with these attacks and am merely seeing that they are comfortable with executing them. The groundwork I teach also includes tackles and leg takedowns, so I instruct Uke to tackle or shoot a leg takedown if he can. If Nage gets taken down, it's not over until he regains his feet. This is to get them comfortable with the idea that just because they get taken down, it's not over. I consider that my experiment has worked far better than I could have hoped. It has not only made me confident that my students can face violence and survive if they have to, but that we have not turned Aikido into some kind of blood sport. We have had no injuries to speak of, and students have a great time learning and building their competence. They have remarked to me what a difference it makes to be confident against dealing with a potential attacker. There are several reasons that I'm hesitant to share all of this on the open internet, so I will offer this to gold subscribers of my Spirit Aikido online program only. I provide a list of the first test techniques and a full breakdown of the reasoning behind the choices I made and the specific fundamentals each technique reinforces. I also go into the test criteria for all the rank levels. As I said at the beginning of this episode, these are guiding light principles. They should be what you always come back to as new students come in and start learning. They should provide the best reminders of good fundamentals. I'm delighted to help assist those who want to improve their Aikido and make it more practical, especially to make it self-defense capable. My experiments have proven to me that it is not only possible to do, but it's also an enjoyable and satisfying process. I have never for a moment felt that things I have brought in have compromised the character or morality of what Aikido represents, which is to end violence as quickly as possible with the least amount of harm. I'm also delighted to assist dojos and instructors who have decided to become independent. I've been hearing and seeing more and more of this in the last several years. Whether due to poor politics or just a difference in what type of Aikido they want to train, the reason doesn't matter. Taking control of your own destiny and forging your practice group into the kind of martial arts training you really want is a noble endeavor. There's no reason to be studying someone else's Aikido unless it provides you benefit. When you find it is not beneficial for your own growth, it's time to look at finding what is going to take you where you want to go. Becoming independent was a very liberating experience. It was more than a little scary at first, and it may be for you too. It's nothing to fear, and if you feel you are stifled where you are now, give serious thought to making a change. It can be done, and it can be the very best thing to happen to your Aikido. I admit that this is all still a work in progress, and I'm always learning new things and adjusting as I go along. That's the nature of a journey. It's not about the destination, but the path that you are traveling. If you feel like you are not enjoying your training as much as you used to, it may be that you're not on the right path for you. Perhaps you have outgrown your group, or they are just on a different path. Something to think about. I assure you that there are others out there who are on their path which is very close to yours. You only need to find them and start working together. The internet is a fantastic tool to help you find and connect with those people. What do you think? Please share your ideas in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube, or go to the Facebook group Aikido the Marshall side and post a comment. The Spirit Aikido online program is now live. Subscribers get access to video training and mentoring to techniques and training methods that I've adopted from other martial arts to make my Aikido more practical. There's a link in the description section. I invite you to check it out. 
I always enjoy hearing from listeners of the show, whether through comments or questions. Thank you all for sharing your interest. Enjoy your training.